Okay, it's my great pleasure to introduce um, a longtime friend, colleague, and inspiration, Ron Swayzgood. Ron is director of applied research at Crest, San Diego Zoo's research unit, and he also is the director of um, panda conservation research, panda research. Um, he received his undergraduate degree at UNC Chapel Hill, and then went to Davis, where Gray and Ron and I were all um, graduate students together. Um, and then after Davis uh, landed as a, initially a postdoc at the San Diego Zoo, and then sort of turned this into a, a, a career. Um, he's a leader in the field of conservation behavior, integrating ideas, fundamental ideas, animal behavior into conservation biology. And um, his breadth and depth of knowledge about communication and intra-specific interactions really comes up with novel solutions for um, uh, conservation problems, particularly associated with translocation and captive breeding. He studied everything, and today he's going to tell us about some of that. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Well, some of that was right, at least. <laughs> um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I think as maybe you could probably ascertain from the title, uh, put the word journey in there. It's a, this is going to be a quasi-autobiographical account of some of the work that I've been involved in for the last uh, 10 or 15 years. Um, and you know, as such, it's, uh, if you're one of those people that really relishes hearing all the experimental details, you're going to be disappointed because I'm just going to touch upon uh, you know, quite a few different projects and programs. And really, uh, I want to illustrate an approach that we're using. Uh, more than uh, the actual, um, you know, uh, details of the methods. So uh, uh, we have, as I hope you'll see, we have a, a lot of uh, wide-ranging projects uh, in, in my division, and I'm, you know, uh, I'm involved in these projects to varying degrees. Um, but I'm just going to illustrate some of the, some of our work here, and in particular, the way we approach things is we're really trying to develop a conservation toolbox. But we want to solve conservation problems, but we also want to help move forward uh, the development of conceptual and methodological tools for solving other problems. And you know, uh, so we identify a conservation problem. Too often, I think uh, people solve conservation problems through more of a trial and error process. And uh, what we're trying to do is, is apply, uh, you know, a scientific method and use uh, theory and search for some unifying frameworks, uh, theoretical frameworks that can help guide us in, in finding these solutions a little bit faster than the trial and error method. Um, and today I'm going to just go over three of the tools that we've been working on, uh, or, or that we've been applying uh, tools on, I should say. Uh, we're going to look at communication and conservation breeding, uh, identifying habitat needs and limiting resources, and the role of habitat selection in reintroduction programs. So um, first of all, uh, my bias is, uh, I guess, sensory ecology would be the best way to describe it, how or organisms acquire uh, and respond to information in the environment. I'm interested in signaling in, in conservation breeding for a number of reasons. Uh, one is that uh, signals govern a lot of social behavior. Uh, there's also a very strong theoretical framework in signaling the signaling literature. And you can manipulate signals, and if you want to change animals' behavior and their conservation interests, you need to find something to manipulate often. So one of the problems, of course, that we encounter in conservation breeding programs is uh, the animals aren't breeding. Um, and sometimes the solution can be, uh, you know, I would say fairly simple, and finding the right combination uh, of animals to get them breeding. Um, you know, five decades ago or so, uh, we learned a lot from Ali and his what's called the Ali effect, and that's that there's, for a lot of species, there's an optimum level of aggregation, and that both densities that are too low or too high can have adverse effects on reproduction in nature as well as in captive situations, and so this has implication for uh, small breeding in small populations. Uh, one of my favorite examples of you know finding a tool to manipulate. Um, a lot of uh, zoos uh, don't have enough flamingos to get them breeding, and simply putting mirrors in there to trick them into thinking there are more flamingos around can get them to breed. So um, the other thing we can do is manage signals in, in the environment. 
This is the giant panda. You can see why it's so charismatic. They have this very charismatic anal gland, um, <laughs> which is why they get so much press, of course. Um, <clears throat> but uh, so I'm going to tell you the uh, story about uh, managing the signaling environment in giant pandas. And we knew that, that olfactory signals were important in this species uh, because they go to tremendous lengths to, to signal um, in their natural environment. But we didn't really know what these signals said, what they meant to pandas. So again, uh, I'm, I'm going to show you all the, the experimental detail here. Um, we devised a number of, uh, of experiments, uh, you know, testing um, in controlled fashion uh, the use of these signals and, um, and, what, and what they mean to pandas, trying to tease out uh, the role that they play, particularly in, in breeding. And here's kind of just a quick summation of some of the results of how, anim how pandas use and perceive those signals. Um, uh, we looked at how, of course, the pattern in which they employ these signals in time and space and across age, sex groups. Uh, we found that these signals do contain information about individuals. They can discriminate individuals. can use them to identify se sex and reproductive condition. Uh, very important. Uh, they play a role in mate preferences. Um, uh, pandas can determine the age of the signaler uh, from these signals. And they uh, signal competitive ability through placement in this uh, handstand position. Um, they also can, can ascertain how long these signals have been left in the environment. Um, and there's a, a, a great deal of seasonal variation and other contextual influences on how these signals are used and what they mean. So it's a very sophisticated and uh, complicated system, really. Um, to just fast forward a little bit, um, I just wanted to, to highlight one study that's ongoing now, um, that we've kind of come back to this problem uh, in, in one of our field programs. And we're looking at how, um, how the habitat features, topography, slope, uh, things like that, affect uh, where they place signals. And uh, we're working in different habitats and uh, types in their, in their natural range. And if you want to maximize the chance that a signal is found by conspecifics, which is what communication is all, right, all about, right, then you would, you would be strategic in where you place them. Um, and um, so we were looking at, at these and made some predictions. And long story short, I'm going to skip the data. Um, we found that pandas do select marking sites. It appears that where they, put, where they select these marking sites appears to be modified for signal function at both micro and macro habitat scales. And therefore, we can consider this an aspect of ritualization. This, this aspect of signaling behavior has been selected um, to maximize uh, detection, basically. So anyhow, the result of, uh, of, of this work is that we now have a better idea uh, what kind of information exchange is going on and what, what this information means to pandas. And you might say, for example, this signal here might say, I'm male, I'm adult, I'm large, I'm a territory owner, owner I'm ready to fight. Um, I was here on February 18th, and hi, my name is Pan Pan. Um, this signal down here might say something like, I'm female, I'm adult, I'm small, I'm going to be fertile tomorrow, and I was here on Valentine's Day, and hi, I'm Lele. If uh, Pan Pan can do math, he's probably a little frustrated right now. <laughs> so, of course, we don't just do research in a vacuum. We work very closely with the managers uh, that, that, that work with these animals. And so we worked with them to develop a new way of creating a, a, a better communication environment for pandas. Um, and we said hey, we use scent postcards and pin swapping to expose them to one another's scent at the right time and we're able to increase sexual motivation, decrease aggression and avoidance, and this is a solitary animal that will respond with aggression or avoidance if you uh, don't, uh, if you don't uh, have all these sort of uh, signals, signaling environment in place. And the end result was um, we went from uh, less than a quarter of the pandas mating naturally to over 90% of the pandas mating naturally in a period of a few years. Um, so that's just a very sp that's a small piece of that that work. We looked at we didn't just look at the olfactory and communication environment. We looked at a lot of other things. Particularly, we, you may have noticed in those pictures that environment was rather impoverished. We did a lot of enrichment work and showed that it had effects on well-being and therefore also mating. Um, end result: 
is uh, we now have a, a, usually a crop. Uh, this was all done at the Wolong Breeding Center. We have a crop of uh, cubs born every year there. It used to be two or three, and now it's 10 or 15. Um, and, you know, if you like graphs better, um, this is what's happened. The population has grown dramatically. And in fact, the, the global captive panda population th just this year reached the target of 300 individuals that was established years ago for a sustainable captive population. And 15 years ago, uh, that popula people thought we should give up on breeding pandas because they just didn't know how to do it. So um, we've also come back to this system because there's some interesting questions left to, to ask and answer. And I've been working with uh, Ben Charlton, who was a postdoc at Zoo Atlanta. Um, he's a brilliant bioacoustician. Bio and we looked at uh, some of, of the vocal cues that pandas use, particularly in the mating context. And we have found results that you know, largely parallel the scent uh, findings that we had. They, could, they recognize individuals, have the potential to recognize individuals. Um, female chirps uh, change in their structure. They're longer, have higher jitter and greater harshness uh, at the time when, just at the time when they're fertile versus pre-fertile. The only other species where that's been shown is in humans, actually. A really interesting study. Um, uh, also, male testosterone uh, affords cues uh, that, uh, uh, of um, testosterone levels that potentially females might utilize. So, in the next, the next uh, part the, of this I'd like to talk about is, is female mate choice and how that affects uh, uh, sustainability and genetics in uh, these small populations. Females don't always make the best choice for conservation. Um, mating decisions are important for conservation because of this thing called effective population size. Uh, a very quick review. Um, basically, it boils down to this is a measure of the ability of genetic diversity to persist through time, through generations. Um, when reproductive success is skewed towards a subset of males, um, uh, there's and only a fraction of males actually pass on their genes to the next generation. This has an impact on the amount of genetic diversity that is passed across generations. So there's a formula. And for example, if you had a population of uh, five males and five females, if all males mate, your effective population would be the same as the population size, which is 10. If only one of those five males mate, your effective population would only be 3.6. So that is a very good illustration as why this is so important for breeding in small populations. The consequences of loss of genetic diversity uh, are include loss of uh, genetic diversity, lower population viability, and inbreeding depression and compromised ability to adapt to environmental change, such as the rapidly evolving pathogens. <clears throat> so its implications for conservation management. Um, we'll need to have founding populations that are, that are much larger to achieve the same objective if there's reproductive skew. Um, and in some cases, intervention, at least temporarily, to, to adjust the skew might be warranted. So reproductive skin, skew can come about from two basic mechanisms. One is male-male um, competition. And in this, this interesting study um, that Alison Alberts did on rock iguanas, uh, there were uh, dominant males were securing most of the mating in this endangered Cuban iguana. It's a wild population. And she removed the, the dominance temporarily and allowed the subdominance an opportunity to breed and therefore um, decreased uh, reproductive skew. Um, sometimes females don't always make the best choices, at least from a conservation perspective. Um, so in some cases, we need to address those choices and get them to change their minds. Um, this is an interesting area of study because uh, there is this, again, the strong theoretical framework for mate choice. And I won't talk about the details, but basically there's two mechanisms. Uh, there's what's called condition-dependent signals and genetic compatibility signals that females use in making decisions. I'm going to talk about the first today. Um, for quite some time, people were making pleas that we should uh, uh, pay more attention to mate choice and conservation. Of course, and Dan was one of the early people to make such a plea in 98, but there was, there was a bit of a lag time before anybody actually utilized this idea to manipulate female mate choice for conservation. Um, and so it's a rel relatively new um, application. 
So, but we, we do, of course, have the tools to manipulate female choice. Um, many of us in the room will be familiar with uh, Anderson's classic study with, with widow birds where he, he cut off, he shortened or lengthened tails of widow birds and showed that he could dramatically affect female preferences uh, based on tail length. So we can do that kind of thing for the endangered species we work with. Um, what we often are trying to do is to maximize or, or, or have optimal outbreeding. And so partners in a, in a captive breeding program are selected based on mean kinship. And I, the goal is to max, maintain maximal genetic diversity. Um, sometimes a female's choice runs counter to the choices that the stud book managers make. So I'm going to uh, talk about um, this application in the pygmy loris. So this, this work was done by a master student I worked with, Heidi Fisher. And uh, we first were trying to think of, well, what kind of cues would a pygmy loris use to choose a male? They're solitary and smelly, kind of like pandas. So we thought that they might use odor cues to select a mate. Um, there's a number of ways that odor cues might uh, uh, convey information about uh, quality of males. And one is the pattern of deposition of scent. A competitive male is going to mark more. It's going to exclude rivals from marking in its territory. And if a rival does get in and mark, it's going to rapidly locate that mark and countermark it. And so what you might see a female walking through the environment may keep coming across the scent of this particular male again and again and again. And occasionally there might be another male intruder, um, but that male rapidly countermarks. And so this is basically uh, an unbluffable cue to the, ability, the male's ability to maintain this territory and exclude rivals. So this would be a good cue for, for so, the, so uh, a, a, an odor that a female is familiar with, therefore, might predict um, that male's competitive ability. So we manipulated um, females' uh, exposure to odor cues from different males. Um, this is really cool because uh, their urine is, has high in lipids, so you can, it looks like this under a UV light. So we manipulated this for a period of weeks, and then we did a, a mate choice trial to see which, whether a female would prefer a familiar smelling male or uh, a male whose odor is novel. And I think this is the most dramatic effects of any experiment that I've been involved with in my career. Um, in terms of effect size, it was huge. Um, it, we looked at you know, spatial and orientation behaviors, um, uh, chemocentric, chemocentric investigation, and most importantly, the social sexual behaviors. And, you know, there's like a tenfold preference for the familiar smelling male. We also took the, looked at the interesting question, question of countermarking and found the same results, um, although not as, as robust. So male, females preferred the top scent male, which is a good cue to competitability, but not as good as excluding rivals, right? So we're going to take this paradigm and apply it to some other species in the near future, and we're working out the details of that now. Um, I don't know if, if the, you know, the, this kind of makeup manipulations for pandas will make them sexier to female or not, but we might try that. So the next uh, area of research that where we've been devoting more and more time is actually is looking at uh, habitat needs of species and trying to look at it at varying levels of sophistication. Um, and again, to return to uh, one of the species I work with most, the giant panda, we want to know what limits population size. And uh, as a specialist that eats 99% bamboo, we might think that bamboo might be one of those limiting factors. But there's probably some other factors in the environment that limit the distribution and abundance of pandas. Um, and these are some of the ones that have been uh, put forward over the years with varying degrees of support. Um, and we we're very fortunate to have access to a huge database from the third national survey for giant pandas. Um, and so we had data uh, that covered 70% of the pandas current range. And that was used to do a population estimate, but they also collected habitat correlates. So we analyzed this data set. Um, 
this is the results. We did a, a model, uh, information theoretic model testing scenario, and I'll just distill that down to uh, the results, which is the best model predicting the panda presence was um, bamboo presence. Well, no surprise there. You know, they're bamboo specialists. Forest age, tree DBH, understory, height, and slope in that order. And then we did, uh, we looked at the Ikeiki weights and to, to, to examine the relative importance of those variables. And what really fell out as being uh, uh, a major result was there's these two, bamboo presence and forest age, were virtually identical in terms of their relative importance in this model. And the other variables were, were, were less so. Um, so, um, and previous work had suggested that slope was a more important variable. It didn't, it didn't in this uh, landscape level approach, slope um, didn't fall out as one of the major ones. But old growth, old growth forest um, is a robust factor for predicting presence of giant pandas. So we, we feel like this has some pretty significant implications for panda conservation. Um, um, there are several reasons that it might be, uh, there might be a preference for old growth. It might be that the quality of bamboo that grows under old growth is better. Um, maybe old growth is further from human activities on average. Or it might provide more and better dens. And this has been an area that we've been looking at more closely. Um, this is going to be very important for policy and planning for giant panda conservation because uh, now we, we understand that old growth is you know, as important as, as bamboo. Um, it's going to change the maps that we're creating uh, for a suitable habitat for pandas. And it has great implications for this logging ban that the government of China implemented over a decade ago. And it's expiring this year. And they have to decide what to do going forward in terms of panda conservation and other conservation issues. So a compatible area of research um, that we're working on is denning ecology. Um, in Faux Pig Nature Reserve, where we're doing this work, um, pandas den in cave dens. But uh, I'll kind of, here's the spoiler alert, um, there, are no, there are no old growth trees in this reserve. Uh, what we looked at, the number of, of characteristics that might, about, about the microhabitat that might tell us about um, their preference. Um, uh, we looked at, uh, at these factors and did uh, log a logistic regression. And the variables, in other words, they predicted that pandas will prefer cavities that have a narrow entrance, a deep roomy chamber, um, that are close to water, and on steeper slopes. And I think if you think about it, all those things will help regulate that micro uh, microclimatic environment, keeping it warm and dry. Um, if the female needs to leave um, water to get some water, she, she's gone from the cub for a shorter period of time, things like that. So in most of these panda reserves, um, they're, they're, they're all forested, but the forest is secondary growth. Um, so historically, pandas would have had access to uh, these nice tree dens, and there would have been more of them, and perhaps there's a dis difference in quality of dens as well. So uh, we've started to get some insights into these questions. Um, and so in, so in areas, in, in uh, most reserves, um, there isn't this, uh, there, there's this long history of logging. I mean, this is the most populous country in the world, so they've done a lot of resource extraction. Um, we've been working with maternal care studies in these dens, and they're starting to provide some, some insights. We use remote video surveillance, and then we also measure several things about the habitat and climate, microclimate around it. And now I want to tell you a quick story of one of, one of the things that we've learned. It's kind of, it's just an anecdote at this point, but it's pretty revealing. Um, to give you a little background, pandas are thought, pandas have twins about half of the time. And we've, for years, we've all thought that pandas don't rear the second twin. In captivity, they don't appear to. They reject one, abandon one, and, and, and rear the other. Um, however, we only give them about five minutes to make that decision because it's just been dogma that they won't rear two. Um, and there's been virtually no studies of this in the wild. So this female um, gave birth to twins. And for 17 days, she did uh, a fine job of rearing both twins. And then um, one night, so this is, this, this is a cave den. It's on a cliff. One night, uh, a rainstorm came. 
and the den flooded. And she, she was able to move one den, or one cub, um, and the other one she abandoned about 50 feet from the den entrance. So uh, it was very, other than this, it was very healthy. So we're, we're starting to rethink what we think we know about uh, maternal care in pandas. Um, and or, let me see what I left in here. Um, we're, we're questioning whether maybe, uh, maybe pandas are uh, facultatively reducing their litter, not, um, it's not obligate litter reduction. And if the conditions are right, they can and do and will rear twins. But uh, perhaps more importantly, from a conservation perspective, this again is, is pointing to a need for potential more and better quality dens. If the tree dens, which tend to be up on the ridges, are less prone to flooding, and also there were many more of them, so if the female, maybe she would not have had to move these cubs um, if she was in a tree den, or if there were lots of them around, maybe the next den would have been 100 yards away instead of a mile away. So um, this may be one of the things that's regulating population size. Um, let's skip over that. Obviously, you can't get old growth overnight, so we're looking at some temporary fixes, and that includes starting to build some artificial dens. And uh, this is in the preliminary stage, but we're designing dens based on what we've learned from their preferences. Um, and um, we hope to implement, implement this on a reserve-wide scale in the next year, if we can get permits. Um, and we're just, uh, and so this will be a short-term solution to kind of upregulate these populations while we're waiting, you know, for a few centuries for old growth to reestablish. Um, this is another emerging program um, with Andean bears, and we're also, and I don't have any real data to share with you yet, but I just wanted to, to uh, highlight this briefly. Um, <clears throat> this is a species that most researchers who have worked with them have seen them you know, once or twice a year. And we've partnered with a young woman out of, out of British Columbia who's gonna be pursuing her graduate work. But she, through uh, a lot of grit and determination, has uh, carved out this wonderful field program in the dry forest of Peru. And uh, we're working closely with her now, but uh, uh, she gets all the credit for having uh, done all the, the groundwork. In fact, she now recognizes 32 individual bears in this, site, in this one site, which is uh, just incredibly remarkable. So we feel like we have this great opportunity to learn more about them. Um, and we already learned a lot of interesting natural history. Um, but, and we've, uh, for example, their ability to climb cliffs, which is just remarkable. They go up and down these 2,000 foot sheer face cliffs. So they take a climber, you know, a half a day to climb, they do it in 20 minutes with cubs. Um, and uh, yeah, um, and we found the first den that's ever been described for the species. Now one of the things we want to look at, we're very interested in what limits population size in all, in all these programs. And we think we may have found one limiting factor, and that's the Pasayo tree. Uh, this is, again, this is dry forest. And what's amazing is, for about six months out of the year, their primary resource, food resource, is this tree. Not the leaves, not the fruit, the tree. They chew it down like a beaver, and they'll sit there for a week and eat this tree. So I think that's, that's an incredibly interesting natural history observation, and so we're gonna be doing some research looking at that and other resources that they use more closely. Um, we're also working with a lot of local species, and one that lives right here in the San, San Bernardino Mountains and uh, and in the uh, Angeles National Forest as well is a mountain yellow-legged frog, highly endangered. Estimates are 120 adults in the wild in the southern population. And uh, one of the things we have a, a breed and release program that we're working on, but uh, we're also looking at habitat. Um, partly to, to select good reintroduction sites and partly to understand the habitats. And so I've got a, a, a master student who's been working on this, Frank Santana. And uh, so what we found is, um, for example, that frogs, the adults, prefer deep long pools with little understory and lots of leaf litter. And the tadpoles, by contrast, prefer habitat with less understory and more leaf litter and rock pools. I and mean, again, we're, we're using this to, to guide uh, selection of reintroduction sites, among other things. 
And then for the, the third and final main topic I want to talk to you about today is, is habitat to sele selection and dispersal, and particularly the role they play in reintroduction and translocation programs. <clears throat> Often there are very simple cues that will guide habitat selection. Um, dispersal is a, a transit uh, phase, um, and it's in, in the life history of individual animals, it's the, it's, it's the most risk-prone, most dangerous phase of life. Um, they're traveling through unfamiliar environments. Um, they may have difficulty locating food and resources. They're more vulnerable to, to predation. Their stress may play a role. There's encounters with, um, with conspecific competitors, etc. So what appears to have happened is um, many animals have evolved to use quick and dirty rules of thumb for selecting habitat. Um, they may use, rather than go in and actually measure all the resources, or, uh, or they may use a quick and dirty vegetation structure um, as, a, as, a, as a correlate to habitat quality. Um, <clears throat> related to this is the conservation problem of animals not settling where we'd like them to. So you may establish a new reserve or some sort of safe heaven, haven. Um, but that species doesn't, doesn't disperse and settle there. Um, when we reintroduce species, sometimes they disperse very long distances, which increases their exposure to those risks we were talking about. The longer, the further you disperse, the greater the cumulative risk you incur. Um, and they may actually make poor settlement choices, particularly in altered landscapes. So you may find areas where there is perfectly suitable habitat, but uh, the species of interest hasn't chosen to live there. So now I'm going to make the case for manipulating cues to try to get animals to settle um, in places that are indeed suitable for them. Um, I'll talk about this more later, but that is rhino dung that I'm dumping out of the back of that pickup truck. So one of the theories that is really guiding a lot of our work is this idea of conspecific cueing or conspecific attraction. Uh, Judy Stamps was uh, a major uh, force in shaping our thinking about this phenomenon. Um, but what we now know um, is that animals will often use the presence of conspecifics to assess habitat quality. All else being equal, animal pref prefers to settle adjacent to conspecifics, even territorial, solitary, and aggressive animals. Um, and so this has been pretty slow to find its way into the wildlife management literature, but I was happy to find a couple of years ago um, this quote, which you can read um, from Journal of Wildlife Management. And it is becoming, in the last uh, three or four years, people are starting to pay attention to this as, as a factor uh, that, that is really governing a lot of habitat selection decisions that individual animals make. And of course, what, what they're doing is um, they're relying on this, 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 uh, this rule of thumb that if there's conspecifics present, there must be, the habitat must be suitable and you know, predation can't be too bad or else there wouldn't be anybody there. And that's why duck decoys work. We, we're, we're manipulating a cue that tricks animals into thinking that this is suitable habitat and safe. So conspecific cueing has been used in a conservation context, increasingly so. Um, and here's a few examples. With these fairy terns, they used uh, decoys, models, to uh, actually establish a new breeding territory where there had been none drew them in. Um, playbacks have been used for several species of song and uh, you can um, uh, facilitate territory settlement simply by play but playing back song. Uh, quick review on reintroductions. Um, they haven't always been successful. Um, they do, in fact, they have a fairly low success rate by most measures. Um, captive releases, of course, have a lower success rate than translocations, which is a wild-to-wild -wild relocation of an animal. Um, but even in the, quote, successful programs, we, there's a high mortality rate, uh, often greater than 50%. Uh, here are these, and somebody finally bothered to follow translocations of tree squirrels as nuisance translocations, um, and, and found that actually 97% of those um, uh, that were those translocations resulted in the death of an individual. So I'm not sure about the welfare implications of, of that since those are welf welfare motivated translocations. But um, uh, there really hasn't been much improvement in this in the last 20 years. 
which tells us we need to think, we, we need to do more, more thinking about how we're doing this and, rather than just doing the same old, same old. Um, there's two basic ways to do a, a reintroduction. One is a hard release, basically you take them out and drop them. Others is a soft release, and usually that means you, you build an acclimation pen so they get used to the local environment. Maybe you provide a little food and water, you might intervene if something goes wrong. Um, but uh, meta-analyses show that soft releases don't really have a higher performance or success rate than hard releases. And I think it's because of, it's a very simplistic, <laughs> the, the, the approach to soft release is, a, is actually very simplistic. It's a, you know food and water and, and little else. And uh, there is not much emphasis on what happens in the post-release environment. Um, and they really don't pay attention to what's ecologically and psychically relevant to the needs of the animal. So one of the big problems we encounter in these kinds of animal relocations is dispersal after you release them. If you think about it, a translocation is a forced dispersal. You've taken that animal and you've moved it. And then, and then we, I guess we shouldn't be that surprised that once you relocate them that you have these large post-release movements. And again, this is a high risk, high mortality period. So the, the longer, further an animal goes, the greater the chance that they're gonna meet their maker. Um, and so uh, I've puzzled on why people haven't spent more time and energy on addressing this, this question in, in these reintroductions. Um, so today I'm going to talk about three different uh, uh, ideas or theories that might uh, account for this. One is the conspecific queuing that we've already talked about. Um, one is uh, um, NHPI, NHPI, Natal Habitat Preference Induction. And the other is disrupting the social environment. So conspecific queuing, um, we looked at this in a, a black rhino translo translocation program in southern Africa. Um, the goals, of the, the stated goals of the government that was doing the, these translocations was of course to maximize population growth. You want to move rhinos out of areas where they're doing really well, high density areas, and reestablish them in ranges where they'd been extirpated previously, and also facilitate metapopulation management. So we found reserves that were donors and receivers um, um, in, uh, across Southern Africa. Um, and there really wasn't much, in these movements, there really wasn't a lot of work done to monitor what happens after release. And so we thought this is a great experiment just waiting to happen. Um, before we try to do, do your homework first, and so we did a number of studies to understand the species. And, and of course, again, with my interest in sensory ecology, we did look at a lot of communication, particularly olfactory communication. And then we, at the release area, we prepared it. And this is where we get into the whole, whole thing of distributing rhino dung. Um, sometimes the hard way, you can't get everywhere in a truck um, in these reserves. So we had to backpack it out. But here's our experimental design. Each one of these, we tried to mimic within this area what would be like a, how a, a rhino would distribute its dung. And so we set up these virtual scent territories. And then we predicted when they released, they would come and settle uh, next to. And these are solitary aggressive, so they don't want to settle on, on top of them, but uh, next to. And um, then, you know, then you do the actual translocation. Easily done. Luckily, the government was already doing this, so we didn't have to do that part. And uh, I've got about 20 slides like this, and they're all the same. Every rhino established its territory adjacent to and partially overlapping the, the virtual scent territory. Um, so um, it worked very well. So we found that, indeed, the solitary aggressive animal did prefer to settle adjacent to conspecifics. And now we can use this olfactory management to, to guide the settlement process. And we work very closely, again, with the managers. And they have adopted this in many cases. Um, and are continuing to, to, to do this kind of uh, dung manipulation. So our next case study is gonna be with Stevens Kangaroo Rat, and this is gonna be the work of Deborah Shire, who by the way, she, she works, she's a scientist in my division, but she's also adjunct faculty at, here as well. We also wanna convince people they're not rats, so they wanna conserve them. But, um, um, this species is even more important because it's what's called a keystone species. They, uh, they engineer their environment. And so you can see 
um, in this experimental paradigm the, the impact that uh, K-rats can have in engineering the environment and maintaining the natural ecological integrity. Um, this is Deborah. These are nocturnal animals, so she does her work at night. There's another link to this faculty here, but I won't talk about that one. <laughs> um, of course, to, we're big believers in being able to track um, any animal we move or release, and so even for the, an animal this small, we're able to fit them with uh, VHF uh, radio transmitters. I, sh I should also mention that, mention that Matt Patel here is in the room, and he's done. He was a very integral part of this research program. So, in one question, we were looking at the conspecific cueing, just as we did uh, with the black rhinos, and asking <coughs> whether these olfactory cues would. Uh, facilitate settlement and survival in translocated K-rats? And the answer was yes. The ones that had the, that had uh, this conspecific scent spread at the release site were more likely to settle at the release site. And we also got a little, uh, a, a decent effect on survival, at least in the, the first month. Um, I'm gonna come back to that case and tell you about another experiment that worked much better than that one. But uh, um, our next, uh, next uh, theory that I want to review with you is natal habitat preference induction. The idea here is that uh, dis dispersers prefer to settle in a habitat that is similar to the natal habitat. And that can be for two reasons. One is they're just using a rule of thumb. You know, well, that's the habitat I grew up in, so that, and I survived and I'm here, so I'm going to settle, I'm going to prefer that. Um, so it's just a cue. And the other is perhaps they learn something or something about their development in that in that habitat, they actually perform better in that habitat. They maybe they digest the res the uh, the foraging resources in that habitat better. Um, I'm going to skip over some of these slides here. Um, the important thing to remember in this is that habitat selection is an individual's, not a species decision. What is suitable for one animal may not be suitable for another. So, for example, those of you who came from the far north, that might look like perfectly suitable habitat to you, but some of us from further south would not select that kind of environment, given that choice. So what is important is that animals, what animals perceive as suitable habitat may differ within a species, and therefore you may get an animals per traversing through perfectly suitable habitat for the species and rejecting that habitat and searching for some place more like home. So our question then is in reintroductions, do animals just keep dispersing, looking for some place like home? And uh, there are some, some compelling examples in the literature. For example, with these red squirrels, those translocated from Scotch pine habitat traversed through and rejected Corsican pine ha habitat and settled in Scotch, and the Corsican pine, the reverse. And there is an overall difference in the, ha the quality. I think it's the, the Scotch pine is actually higher, higher quality. They'll have better survival and reproduction if they chose a Scotch pine. I think it's that way. But anyhow, they both rejected the other habitat type. Here's an example where it affected fitness. Um, caribou that were moved from open plains into a mountain area um, behaved differently than the ones that were moved from a, a, from a wooded uh, mountainous area to another uh, wooded mountainous area. And what, what the ones from the open plains did was, come winter, they went to the south facing slopes where in the tundra that worked really well because they would, they would dig and find lichens on the rocks. But in the mountains you want to be on the north facing slope because the lichens are growing on the tree trunks on the north facing slopes. So this, they actually had uh, twice the survival rate to translocate it from a similar environment. Also, I also think that perhaps, and you know, we know that captivity can certainly affect um, these kind of habitat selection decisions. And I think that perhaps what happened with, in the case of the peregrine falcon, which uh, was, um, which has recovered largely because of uh, captive breeding programs. Um, before that, um, you didn't see peregrine falcons in the cities very much. And after the release program, you did. And I'm, nobody studied this, but I, I'm, I'm wondering if you know they, they imprint it, so to speak, on artificial structures in their captive environment. And this actually, in this case, worked well for them because it enabled them to invade a new niche and you know, hunt pigeons from skyscrapers. So we've proposed a series of solutions. Um, 
to NHP PI problems in reintroductions. Um, one, of course, you want to acclimate the animal to the site. But if, it's really a, if there really is a critical or sensitive period in development, that may not be enough. Um, but the other is to simply select a release habitat that is similar to the natal habitat. Um, if it's a captive rearing and release program, we need to be careful to not create preferences for artificial habitats that might affect their decisions once they're released. Um, I'd be interested in exploring the possibility of actually planting cues in the captive environment that you know are going to be in the release environment. So you have this, this the cue sim similarity. Um, and perhaps even exploring the possibility of putting cues in the release environment from the captive environment. And these don't necessarily have, we don't know. You have to test this on a case-by-case -case basis. But these don't necessarily have to be natural cues. And in theory, you could put American flags in the captive environment and then put American flags in the release environment, and that might be the cue they use. I don't know. Or maybe they prefer the Canadian flag. But, um, so um, the final uh, topic I'm going to talk to you about today is the role of, of uh, disrupting social relationships and the impacts it can, it can play. And this, again, this is Deborah Shire's work. This is from her PhD work at UC Davis. But um, she found, and with black-tailed prairie dogs, which are, of course, colonial, very social, live in family groups, that if you translocate them in a, a groups of familiar family groups, they actually had a 500% higher survival rate than if you translocate them and move them at random with regard to uh, individuals that they're released with. Um, in the uh, solitary and aggressive black rhino, um, it's interesting, you know, um, at the source environment, you know, they, they, they work out their differences, so to speak. I mean, they're aggressive, but they have, they've, they've developed agreements um, and relationships even with their rivals. Um, but you, if you, when we relocated them, um, they fought a lot. And um, even at lower densities than where we captured them from. So it's not just, a, it's not just about density. Um, but we found that if we, if we release them in a big enough area so that these unfamiliar rhinos had enough space to get away from each other, that we could uh, we reduce the encounter rate, we reduced fighting, and we, reduced, and we increased survival. So this, this line of thinking led us to applying this, to, again, to the kangaroo rat. Again, this is a solitary, aggressive species. Um, even in you know even in mating situations in captivity, if you put them together at the wrong time, kind of like the panda, they actually fight to the death. So um, you don't think of these as being you know a, a tight knit social group. Um, but so we but we thought uh, you know in a translocation paradigm, you're exposing the animal to all kinds of cost. You've got all these costs of you know exploring a novel environment. Uh, you know, uh, 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 remaining uh, vigilant to, to predators in an unknown environment, securing resources. Maybe the cost of renegotiating those relationships with territorial neighbors may be an added cost. And frankly, you know, we didn't, we thought it would have an effect, but we didn't think it was going to have a major effect. So this is, this was really interesting. Found dramatic effects on survival and reproduction. So we had control groups that were moved at random with regard to the neighbors, and then other groups where we moved them with their neighborhood intact. So sort of replicating the geometry of those neighborhoods. And across all measures across the year, there was a large effect on survival. The uh, neighbor translocated groups survived at three times the rate of the controls. And then the number of pups per female was also, so reproductive output was much greater. Um, for the neighbor translocated groups. And then if you take those two things and add them together, the end result from a conservation standpoint in trying to establish a new population, which is what we're trying to do here, um, so 24 to 1 difference in overall productivity. So, um, and uh, this is also, for the behavioral ecologists in the room, there is something that, that kind of led us to this thinking called the deer enemy effect. Um, and, um, and people have talked about the potential cost and benefits of establishing relationships with neighbors, but no one's ever demonstrated a fitness effect to that. So to the best of our knowledge, this is the first demonstration of a fitness effect in social behavior in a solitary animal. 
So um, we got a lot of insights from the behavioral data that help us explain these results. The neighbor translocated groups forged more, fought less, traveled less, um, selected, uh, settled down closer to the release site, and they settled sooner, and they established their burrows, very important, uh, more quickly. So what appears to be happening is the controls are just investing too much time and energy and renegotiating those social relationships, and that's distracting them from other priorities, like getting the burrow in, um, and per and avoiding predators, probably, and, and other things. So to conclude, um, what I'm really advocating here is, um, if you think about the different approaches that I've been illustrating today, we're borrowing concepts and tools from a number of dis different disciplines, particularly behavioral ecology, conservation, and applied ethology. And each, each discipline brings different things to the table. Um, and if we integrate those things that they bring to the table, um, I think we're going to have a more vibrant and more successful uh, way to solve conservation problems. And behavioral ecologists, for example, um, they have this strong theoretical framework and a focus on the adaptive value of individual animals um, and fitness. And, uh, and until recently, um, ha have not focused too much on proximate mechanisms. Um, conservation biologists, of course, um, they understand some of those uh, important threats to the animal populations. Um, they understand population ecology um, and habitat and ecosystems. They also understand the nuts and bolts of government regulations and policy better often. And applied ethologists um, bring um, a better understanding of proximate mechanisms, particularly things related to stress um, and perception, which uh, um, there's whole talks that could be given on the role of stress in translocation or introduction programs, for example. So I think I'm out of time, and that's all I have to say. Thank you. Neglected to say he's also an adjunct uh, faculty member in our department. Um, you should all feel comfortable contacting him, going down and visiting. And he teaches a, a course, uh, a workshop day down at uh, San Diego Crest um, in the spring. And uh, that is supposed to be pretty good. Questions? So I think the you know taking the uh, dung of con specifics and you know spreading it around and making him feel like home is is super cool. Um, have people done sort of similar things? Like, say you're going to reintroduce a wolf, you you know collect their urine over the period of a few weeks and put it in a squirt bottle and decide to spray it around the area where they're going to release them so that when they get there, it's like, it smells like home. You know, like, have it, people done that? No, to the, to the best of my knowledge, these two examples are the only two examples in the literature where scent cues have been manipulated for for conservation purposes. There has been a little bit with acoustic cues. There's, uh, some, there's been a couple examples where playbacks have been used. Um, but no, it's really, uh, and there's, this, there's been this real lag um, from applying what we're learning in behavioral ecology to, uh, to, to these conservation um, programs. And I think you know wildlife managers who often do a lot of this work just haven't you know, really um, taking the time to entertain the possibility that things like this matter. Um, so, but I think it's starting to change a little bit. Especially if we can start producing some good examples like this that gets their attention. Question. Uh, have you ever encountered an example or you think of an example that might involve negative selection against habitat and negative community that might be including individuals from selecting habitat that otherwise promising habitat? I mean, other than maybe the school. Yeah, no, there's, yeah, the, the, the theory would predict that. I can't think of an example. Um, Judy Stamps might be able to answer that question because she's actually, that's, in, with NHPA, they talk about positive and negative. So, yeah, basically, yeah, if your childhood sucked, um, then you should not prefer that habitat, right? Um, <clears throat> so, um, and I know that they've made that prediction. I can't remember if there's good empirical examples for that or not. And it hasn't been applied in, there's no examples from conservation literature. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that you're working with 
mentioned that proximity to urban areas might be a factor that influences uh, panda presence. Um, mm -hmm. Did you look at any of the those like correlations in den preferences? Like, do you put that into the model? And also, um, I was just wondering how many wild pandas are left. Like, mm -hmm. I have no idea. Good questions. Um, yeah, that's uh, we are looking at um, in the in the reserve where we're working, Foping Nature Reserve. Um, it it's it ha, it's experiencing a slight upsurge in ecotourism, and so we're trying to map the uh, human activities and see how it affects pandas' use of space, including dens. I don't have we don't have those data yet, so the answer is no, we don't have that. Um, and the, est the best estimate uh, for pandas left in the wild is about 1,600. It's a very crude estimate, um, but it's based on this national survey. But they have to, you don't see pandas in the wild very often unless you, you know, GPS collar them. Um, so they have to extrapolate from finding feces to individuals, which is a difficult thing to do. Um, there's a new, uh, of course, DNA sensing is starting to offer a, a, a different and perhaps better solution. No, I think I think you're right. they're, they're definitely not mutually exclusive, and I think that all I mean, and that's just three. There's other there's others. I just, there's just three of my pet favorites because um, they're intellectually interesting to me, partly. But um, uh, I would love to try to come up with you know sort of life life history predictors for when these you know if we get a suite of these variables, including those three plus others, but if uh, to predict when and where one may apply more than the other. But I, right now, you know, I don't, and I, I don't have anything. And it's more, it's more based on, you know, judgment and intuition and, uh, you know, brainstorming sessions as to, and often it's, so for example, conspecific attraction and using scent. Well, well what, it, it's really more about, well, what cue do we think they'll use for conspecific attraction, not is conspecific attraction going to be important for the species? Because I don't know, I mean, I'm not aware of many examples where it's been rigorously researched and found not to be the case. So it, may, it, may, it, it may almost always be the case. I don't know. Okay, let's thank Ron again. We'll be right